Today on Building the Open Metaverse. The idea that our identity online and how we relate to other people as digital beings is becoming even more important to a huge swath of the world than even our physical identities. Welcome to Building the Open Metaverse, where technology experts discuss how the community is building the open metaverse together. Hosted by Patrick Cozy from Cesium and Mark Petit from Epic Games. Hello, I'm Mark Petit from Epic Games, talking to you from Los Angeles today, and my co-host is Patrick Cozy from Cesium. Hey, Patrick. Hey, Mark. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm enjoying. Uh, I'm enjoying California this week. Very nice. Yeah, I'm doing well as uh, as well. We're here recording on Monday, and I actually ran a, a half marathon Saturday morning, so I'm, I'm fully recovered, feeling 100. percent Today, we're very excited because we have uh, uh, another pioneer on our show. Uh, somebody who's a longtime serial entrepreneur, author, advocates for game developer, and for dev games developer. It's John Radoff, the CEO of Beamable. John, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Mark. Excited. Yeah, we've been waiting for this moment because you know you, you you've been talking about the metaverse way before Patrick and I. So we're like a little bit of anxiety <laughs> today. Uh, it feels like you know your blog has been uh, has been something that's very been very insightful for for a long time. So thanks for that contribution, and we're trying to trying to follow your lead and be as you know as as rational and as as good as you are. So I, I think you just said I'm a hipster. I was talking about it before it was cool, but okay, I'll I'll own it. <laughs> so John, we, we love to kick off the podcast by asking our guests about their journey to the metaverse. And, and for you, you clearly have a huge passion for games and for programming. I mean, let's go back to, to 1992 when you created one of the earliest commercial text-based massively multiplayer online RPGs, uh, Legends of Future Past. Yeah, that was, so I'm, I'm going to even go back further. So the, the, the first game that I ever made, I was eight years old and my father got me access to a mainframe computer at Digital where he worked. And I was also a huge nerd around Dungeons and Dragons at the time. So made kind of a Dungeons and Dragons game that had like 2D maps and fighting and things like that on it. You know, I, I did part of it. I think my dad did a lot of it, um, but that was sort of my start in the industry. So for better or worse, there's been so, sort of a role-playing game and D&D &D aspect to my career. There's been a computer programming aspect to my career, and, and I've run with it ever since. But yeah, what, by the time I was 19, I had been playing um, these MMOs. They weren't even called MMOs at that time. They were like MUDs on commercial services like CompuServe and Genie. And I met my future wife in a game called Gemstone. And we were just convinced we could build a better game than the one we were playing. So we ended up moving in together. I dropped out of college and, and we launched Legends of Future Past. But in my view, like that kind of game experience, the whole multiplayer aspect where there's a heavy social element like that, that to me is like the start of the metaverse. Like even Dungeons and Dragons without a computer before that was the metaverse. And everything since then is like, using technology to provide more immediacy, break down spatial barriers, break down temporal barriers, and get us in the room together in the imaginary world together with each other. And, and I've been doing that my whole life. Some of the stuff you've done outside of gaming, right? So you worked on ePrize and then Gamer DNA before you started Disruptor Beam. Oh, cool. Yeah, I don't, I don't usually get a chance to talk about all my non-game stuff, but um, you know, when the web was coming along, it was very technical, hard to make websites. Um, we take it for granted now because you can just go to Squarespace or something and launch a website. But in the early days of the web, it was hard to do. And the opportunity I saw was just make it really easy for people, not have to know coding or servers or anything like that. So we built a piece of software called ePrize. And what it did is, is it did all of that for you. It made it super easy. And the, the funny thing you bring up is it's like the same pattern I see over and over again in any kind of creator economy. So you take the web, for example, like the earliest stuff is like hackers and programmers, they just build stuff because they're willing to, to take the time and figure it out and they make stuff and it's way more work than it should be. But they do it anyway because it's fun. That's that's what we hackers do. Um, but eventually what you need is something that anybody can access for it really to scale up across the market. So whether that was 
websites back in the day of ePrize or whether e-commerce, you know, that's been democratized um, by companies like Shopify now, or then the whole era of 3D engines. Like, you know, there's a couple of companies that have built really strong 3D engines that have opened up access to the whole universe of spatial computing and graphics to people. To me, the metaverse game development, generally speaking, is lacking that that framework that just makes it easy so that you can imagine something, sit down in front of your computer and just go to work on the creative side of things without having to be so concerned about all the plumbing, the technology, scalability, economic systems, all that other stuff that really makes this kind of software work. And you took E-Prize public, right? How was that IPO experience? Uh, uh, insane, crazy, interesting, learned a, learned a ton. Some of the stuff I learned um, definitely remains pertinent to this day. You know, of course, in other cases, things have changed from the dot-com era. But, um, you know, that, yeah, I, I started a company and two years later, it was 20 million in ARR, which, um, which was amazing. And we were able to really create something from it and build a public company. I mean, it was a weird market when we went out because then everything went sideways for quite a long time and we ended up merging with someone else. But great experience, uh, got, got to build so much, work with great customers, solve real problems and see what happens when you go from you know zero to 300 people in a two or three years. Yeah, quite an amazing experience for an entrepreneur to go you know that fast to an IPO and then manage it through a, a downturn. Downtown happens. I mean, you know, we're <laughs> as we can attest. Uh, they tend to come back. <laughs> I've noticed. Regularly. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've been through a couple in my career. Um, it's always challenging. So tell us about Binebo. What was the the founding principles behind that company? Well, but between some of the stuff we were just talking about and Beamable, I, I had run a game studio called Disruptor Beam, and and we built some games built on very popular TV shows. So the biggest game we built was a Star Trek game called Star Trek Timelines. Um, we also were the first online game for Game of Thrones. We made a game called Game of Thrones Ascent. So we really cut our teeth on the whole experience of how you bring story and multiplayer and like metaverse -y kind of social interaction together, but around these grand stories and universes that people love so much. Uh, but it was through that experience that that I saw a few problems, and one of it, one of them was that you spend so much time building the infrastructure and the technology and the scalability and things like purchasing systems and social systems, all, all of the foundational piece, which everybody always underestimates. And even if they figure out how to build a few pieces of it, they always underestimate scale. So, you know. Companies always um, run into problems when suddenly they have millions of users for the first time. And I've seen companies get shut down because they had millions of users and they weren't prepared for it, which is a real tragedy when that happens. So the whole idea behind Beamable, which was born out of a whole reorganization outside of Disruptor Beam, was to focus on the technology, to really bring games to life. We use this term live services. like. Live services is literally about bringing games to life for communities of players who are going to be interacting with each other, competing with each other in real time, cooperating with each other, all of the social systems that go around that, living dynamic economies within games, and all of the customization that you need to bring to game servers and, and game systems to enable that. So that's what Beamable is, and that's what we've been doing now with uh, a number of games that have launched over the last couple of years with us. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about those online services because they're going to be a critical component uh, of the metaverse because kind of by definition, everything is going to be social um, in the metaverse. So, you know, where, where do you see the biggest in needs for innovation there? I mean, you know, we still have 100 players per, per instance. I mean, this is... You know, this is not very this is not very social, right? How do we break those barriers? What do you think companies like Beam World can help in that in that respect? Well, the, so there's foundational stuff that is just still really complicated to incorporate in your game, and it and it's sort of 
basic table stakes, like how do you actually have a persistent world? How do you preserve the state of all your users? How do you preserve the state of all of the objects and items and things going on in your universe? Even that alone is wildly inconsistent from company to company, and they have to end up buying. Usually they, what they do is they buy like web server technology. They'll, they'll use like Node.js or something like that because that worked for websites. And suddenly they're building a game server off of like web technology. So we see that all the time. So, you know, the foundational piece of like data store, persistent world, and then the objects that you create on top of that, like users and their identities, their account history, the competitive leaderboards as people start um, competing with each other or cooperating with each other, the social systems like guilds, cooperative systems within guilds, how do you recruit people to guilds, all of the economic systems. So how do you maintain all of the SKUs, so to speak, to use e-commerce language, but all of the items, the things that work within your environment, how do you relate that back to how you obtain those items? How do you purchase them? Do they spring forth from treasure chests that you find along the way? Like these are all the things that people end up spending like 70, 80% of their time building if they end up trying to build all that stuff themselves in a live game instead of the actual thing that's important for a game developer, which is storytelling, right? Like I spent a lot of my career with story-based games and Star Trek and Game of Thrones. And all we really wanted to do in those games was focus on like, what is the core fantasy that you have in those worlds? How do you deliver that to the player? And we did a pretty good job in those two games, but we didn't do nearly as much as we would have liked if we weren't like building in-app purchase systems and account systems and data store systems that needed to scale to millions of users. So John, I appreciate that you present yourself as someone who fights for game makers. And <laughs> I was hoping you could share with us a bit about how Beamable helps play a role in that. Yeah, thank you for, for uh, invoking the mantra of our company. That, that's the culture of Beamable, by the way. Like, that's something I put in my tagline, but it's something we tell ourselves every day. It's on all our materials. We fight for the game maker and, and just game making is so damn hard, right? Like that's, that's like full stop the basic problem, which is game making is so hard. There's so many elements. There's so many things that can go wrong. Building the right team for a game is challenging figuring out how to capture the fun, but then not only capture the fun and build a fully comprehensive system around it, then figuring out how do you engage a customer over the long term. And then lastly, how do you connect with an audience? How do you even find the audience like user acquisition and finding a way to scale that? Like all of that is so, so hard that when I talk to game developers and I've been a game developer, and still feel like I'm a game developer, even though it's at the tech layer today, you know, what everybody really loves doing, number one, is making a great game. It's going again to the storytelling, the experiential aspects, the graphics, the artistry, the feature set, the engagement loop of the game. That's what, it, that's what we all like actually making. Um, but we don't get enough time on that. So when I say we fight for the game maker, it's really to fight for that person who cares about that list of things that I was just describing and make sure that they can spend as much of their day as possible on those things. Because not only is it fun for us as game developers, that's why a player is gonna buy a game, right? If you think of it as like investment ROI terminology, like all the alpha that you're gonna deliver in the ROI of your game, is gonna come from how fun the game is. All of the risks you could potentially contribute are gonna come from things like technology, scalability of the tech, scalability of user acquisition. Like those are things that I think just need a lot more specialization and stable platforms that people know they can trust, rely upon, and focus on the, the craft of game making. So, so recently, you know, the news was all about, uh, you know, the merging of, uh, of Unity with uh, Iron Source and the whole uploading saga. So they're, you know, they're kind of juggernauts in this space. So how, how does Beamable position itself uh, in that landscape versus those bigger, bigger guys? Yeah, well, we're 
So I guess we think conceptually of the, the universe of technology that you need to deliver a game fundamentally comes down to the 3D engine to deliver the experience. And then there's an enormous amount of live services infrastructure, right? The live services infrastructure is super fragmented today. There's no consistency. Earlier you ask it, you were asking a little bit about, you know, what differentiates us? What do we see as the big problems in the marketplace? Well, a big part of it is like just having a workflow system that a game developer can sit down in front of and select from the kinds of live services elements that they can build their business around. Not unlike the way you can sit down now in a 3D engine and actually you know, build worlds, build graphics, synthesize all the different pieces, what I call composability. So the composability of 3D graphics and world building and the experiential aspects of games today is you know, really outstanding compared to what it was like a decade ago. In fact, it's improved tons just in the last couple of years. But that same composability, the ease of workflow, the ability to just drop something in and expect that it will scale, that that hasn't been accomplished amongst all the live services elements. So that's that's kind of our focus is providing that framework around it, the workflow that makes it really easy to incorporate live services into a game. We have a lot of shared customers between that. And the knowledge that you bring of games, I think, is pretty unique. I mean, you know, this is a kind of a, this is a kind of deep understanding of, of game maker, I think, which is kind of the hallmark of, of Beamable. So, if you allow me to, to say this, I know you would not say it to yourself. Um, and so, what, you. we we also hear a lot about um, you know new technologies such as the blockchains and NFT in the world of gaming. You know, and of course, these are more concept that would be implementing at the back end. Do you see any, you know, I mean, right now it's the crypto winter. I mean, it's, you know, it's not as fun uh, or to talk about NFT games, but do you, do you foresee, you know, uh, do you foresee a natural usage now that, you know, the, the dust is settling or starting to understand better the technological landscape, you know, what's working, what's not working. Is that, that something that inspires you there? Well, if we take a step back, let, let's maybe talk about what I think remains interesting about it, because certainly it's a complete mess right now. And the market, unfortunately, is full of some really bad actors and people that are just in it for the whole financial speculation game without really being concerned about the the ultimate value proposition that, that it contains. But I think you can identify a few things that are interesting. Number one is really blockchain is a way to solve for the problem of consensus between lots of computers. So consensus is a hard problem to solve unless you're all willing to, to trust one central authority who just stores your data and then tells everybody what they need to know. I mean, that's how the world works today is everything is a trusted authority and, and that's okay if you're willing to live in someone's ecosystem, number one. The challenge with it is getting all the other big players with their own ideas about how they would like to own those ecosystems actually cooperating with each other. So blockchain in terms of solving a consensus problem does it pretty effectively uh, in terms of being able to have big parties as well as any smaller developer who wants to participate in a common data set without having to say, hey, this one particular company is going to be in charge of everything and have all the keys to the kingdom. Now, over the last year in particular, one of the previous critiques of it, which was, well, okay, but consensus is really hard to do with proof of work algorithms because of the, how much cryptographic protocols consume in computing power. I mean, that still remains true for certain things like Bitcoin, but for the things that games and metaverse type stuff will actually run upon, um, it's moved on to these, proof, you know, <clears throat> staked algorithms, which doesn't doesn't require nearly as much energy, it's like 99.9% .9 reduction. But I think solving the consensus problem between lots of parties is really interesting. And then within consensus, the thing that that then really opens up, I think, is the idea of programmatic exchange of value between parties, again, without requiring a broker in between or someone who just sort of owns the whole data store in between. 
the ability to have a piece of software that says, here's some value, meaning money, assets, et cetera, that can exchange it with another piece of software is extremely powerful in terms of composability. So we were talking about composability earlier in terms of the, you know, the universe of 3D graphics and how much more composable that is. The lacking of composability in say live services, well, part of that is you have game economies and you would ideally for certain kinds of things, especially some of the metaverse type stuff that we've been talking about over the last year, you need composability of the economic systems within these universes. And, and that's where I think blockchain gets interesting. Yeah, no, I agree. We're starting to see emerges some use cases that are really valid and it will be interesting to see how those technologies uh, really get adopted and implemented. And well, let's switch gear and talk a little bit about the metaverse as well. Um, we don't quite know what that is, but we like to talk about it. And you've been, you know, <laughs> you've been writing extensively about it too. And uh, by the way, if you don't follow John on Medium, you should. Uh, there's a lot of interesting um, content, and I will read some of it because it's, you know, it's funny to read something from 18 months or two years ago. And your stuff is holding the test of time pretty well. Uh, you know, things change so rapidly. So, so, and, and you introduce this concept of layers of the metaverse. You know. Can you can can you talk to us about you know layers or pockets of the landscape that you're where you're seeing the most innovation or the stuff that excites you the most in the metaverse? Yeah, um, well, let, let me even just take a step back for a moment because you 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 did raise the whole subject of like what does metaverse even mean? Um, you know, there's different ways people talk about it. To some people, it is the crypto stuff we were just talking about. I think that can be part of it, but it's not. It's not, you know, equivalent to metaverse. For some people, it's like AR, VR, like embodied experience. That's that's kind of like the Facebook version of things. And to other people, it's like virtual world platforms, like it's Roblox, it's Fortnite, it's, it's things like that. So um, I think that there's aspects of truth to all of those. But the way I've tried to think about these technologies through my whole career, going all the way back to Legends of Future Past, which we, which we led with earlier, is there's a culture shift. There's a social shift underway. And I think it's really critical to understand how people are using technology differently today and how that's been shifting over time. And the shift that's happening is... The idea that our identity online and how we relate to other people as digital beings is becoming even more important to a huge swath of the world than even our physical identity. So I think I was maybe leading the way a bit when I met my future wife in an online game. When I did it, by the way, that was very weird to do. It's it, I, I probably for a lot of people listening to this now, far less weird. You're, you've been scratching your head wondering what I'm talking about, why I think it's weird, but it was weird when I was doing it. But I think if you look at that trend over time, what you're seeing taking place is what I exactly what I was describing, which is that people are investing more and more in their digital identity. And it, when you start with identity, you then extend out to that into your creativity as well. So your creativity that you express maybe first through your avatar, through your socializations and your social groups like guilds and online games and esports and performance, all that kind of stuff is the next step. And then ultimately it will be people shaping and crafting worlds, not only, you know, not unlike what they do in Minecraft. I, I think of Minecraft, for example, as legitimately part of the metaverse. I don't I don't have these, you know, strict barriers between like you know, metaverse is, are we there yet? I, I think we are there because of the social and cultural trends. But to answer your question about the layers, yeah, I have this whole seven layer model where I've tried to break down the value chain of the industry, like what feeds into the next. But I'll, I'll just kind of focus maybe on the opposite extremes of the seven layers and then comment briefly on what happens in between. I mean, ultimately, the only thing that most people are going to care about with respect to quote unquote metaverse or whatever we end up calling it in the grand scheme of things um, is the experience you have, right? And the experiences are almost entirely games today, but that same game experience, the craft of game making 
that many of us have learned to do is being increasingly applied to things outside of that. So yes, it will impact things like shopping. It'll impact things like simulation in virtual spaces. It'll impact things like the experience of music, just like you can go to a concert in Fortnite and Roblox and join tens of millions of other people who are experiencing a, a concert. Well, that that dialogue that you have between that performer, in that case music, but it could be any kind of performer, and you in the audience is being writ large on the metaverse. And, and that's really just what the experience is about. The opposite extreme, you know, there's incredible innovation happening at the very foundational levels of technology. So the speed of networks, the speed of semiconductors, the whole revolution around GPUs, which I think of as like we're entering from a technology perspective, this is really the matrix generation. And I'm not talking about matrix, the movie, which although that's funny to think about, matrix in terms of just matrix operations, like the GPU does two things amazingly well. It does more than two, but at least two things really well. One is the spatial computing applications of matrix math, and the other is the ability to put artificial intelligence algorithms and train models and run AI models through matrix technology. And GPU does that because, of course, it can do matrix operations in parallel at huge scale that we couldn't do on CPUs before. So, you know, we got experience on one level, which is just delivering those experiences. The GPU kind of tells you where we're going because it's giving us richer, more immersive, spatially computing oriented environments, whether that's on a screen, whether that's in a VR headset, whether it's in some future AR goggles, like it's, it's sort of all enabled through spatial computing, but also AI playing a bigger and bigger role along the way as well, which is everything from characters that you're going to interact with within games. I mean, games are the ones that probably done more in terms of characters with NPCs now for many decades, and, and these characters are going to get more and more interesting. It's AI being applied to the whole creative process itself. Like in the last year, I think people have been blown away by all these computational creativity products that have come along. I'm talking about stable diffusion and stuff like that. Um, the ability to just like take a text prompt and turn that into usable material. I think we're going to see more and more of that stuff helping with the creative process. So there's a huge number of AI applications there, but I'll, I'll kind of end the layers without get it spending an exhaustive amount of time in the five we didn't talk about a lot. But a lot of the middle is really about unlocking creativity, whether that's the creator economy itself, whether it's about the tooling, whether it's about mass market uh, acceptance of the hardware that you need, whether it's the the use of blockchain, for example, or open source as a consensus layer or decentralization layer. All of that is about unlocking the creativity so that you can deliver the experience to people. So, John, one of our favorite topics is interoperability and open standards. It, it comes up on every episode of the podcast. And Mark and I have organized a few SIGGRAPH events, and uh, it comes up over and over again. So, this is a topic that, that you've written a lot about as well. You have a great article on the layers of interoperability and you defined five layers, connectivity, persistence, presentation, meaning, and behavior. So hoping we could talk about these a bit, maybe starting with connectivity, which I believe you, you believe is a mostly solved challenge at this point. Yeah, well, it has to get a lot faster and there's a lot of super interesting problems. So, so uh, I don't want anyone in the 6G world to reach out to me later and be like, well, we're still working on it. <laughs> yeah, no, like there's really, really, really hard problems. Understood, understood. But, um, yeah, like, so let, let's take a step back again on interoperability. This is where people get caught up on interoperability. I think people sometimes get trapped in the thinking that like interoperability has to mean this vastly monolithic system in which everything you can possibly do is prescribed for you and you have to operate within a very distinct set of constraints. I don't think interoperability means that, right? So if you go across the, those list of interoperability domains that we were just talking about, well, there's ones where that makes a lot of sense. For example, the connectivity layer 
I think you could reasonably argue that TCP IP is an amazing interoperability layer that beat out a lot of proprietary networking protocols that existed in the past. And today you can plug your computer in and gain access to all kinds of services through TCP IP. So protocols are kind of the foundational layer of the metaverse. That's why, and, you know, another way I think of the metaverse is it's, it's really just the next generation of the internet building upon these things that already exist, but adding more aspects of creativity and spatial computing and real-time connection with each other. Ooh, let's talk about the, the presentation layer and interoperability there. Yeah. So as you, as you sort of go up this chart, which, which you're referring to, it goes from stuff where it's a little easier to define very specific ways to plug in interfaces between, say, hardware and software layers and TCP IP at the con connectivity layer. But you start having, it starts getting squishier as you go up, right? So we have the World Wide Web, for example. So the web is a way of standardizing a huge amount of how we deliver the presentation layer. HTML is a presentation layer. HTML isn't amazing for delivering things like 3D immersive experiences. So people have, you know, come up with systems, like actually really impressive systems that use things like JavaScript to do that. And there's really interesting work happening in things like WebAssembly. So like there's all kinds of solutions that have been built on like lower levels of languages and the, and the basic technology of a web browser to deliver the presentation layer. Um, I'm, I'm personally a big fan of the idea that accessing the metaverse in the future is going to tap into a lot of things that come from web technology. Now, web has to get more real time. There's a lot of problems we have to solve. Has, a lot of the code has to be much more easily embeddable. Um, maybe stuff like WebAssembly that I was referring to earlier is, is one of the solution pathways for that, amongst others that people are looking at. But I think that like it's got to be like a browser, whether it's a web browser or a meta browser or some other things that we define in the future. It's got to be a browser based technology that allows you to connect to any kind of service and access it, whether it's an MMORPG, whether it's a shopping experience, whether it's that music concert that we were just referring to uh, earlier, because that's what will really dramatically expand access to all of this stuff. What goes hand in hand with the presentation layer is if you can start defining that, how you actually render and deliver it, well, you want to make that readily accessible to the authoring environments as well. So there's a lot of people working on how you standardize that as well, just like we had authoring tools for the World Wide Web, and then it eventually migrated towards actually online tools like Squarespace or Shopify and whatnot, where you could do it inside your web browser more and more of that creative process at the visualization layer, the presentation layer needs to, to, to just become a lot more easy through the tooling of it. Could be universal script like USD, for example, like we don't know what the standard is, but we need more of those frameworks defined so that more tools can enable the creators to deliver through a common browser-based interface what the actual experiential layer is. Yeah, I think we're in violent agreement with that, you know, Patrick and I are part of an effort, the Metaverse Standard Forum that you recently joined, and it's really about, you know, understanding that presentation layer and mm -hmm. trying to understand if what we've seen from USD is, you know, very prominent in authoring tools, and as demonstrated by NVIDIA, very prominent in the runtime space, you know, could that be could those concepts be the foundation for that new presentation standards, which is akin to HTML, but working mm -hmm. for 3D, uh, for 3D virtual worlds. So we are, it's kind of something that's very much top of mind for many of us right now <laughs> at the Metaverse Standard Forum and trying to, uh, trying to, to, to validate that, that hypothesis. So, by the way, what are you drawing? You joined the Metaverse Standard Forum. What are your expectations there? Uh, you know, I think I'm still I'm approaching it with a lot of humility because there's so many people there that are smart, and I think everyone has different views of how you deliver these applications. That's why it's important for me, I think, to try to break down 
these other areas of interoperability because that's that's where I find people tend to grind into like analysis paralysis because if interoperability has to mean everything from I don't know USD to define the rent the the way you describe the graphics of a world and the object placement in a world if that then also has to capture everything that those objects could ever be including from a behavioral standpoint from an economic standpoint like it just gets really super hard so i'm interested in really focusing on how do we draw boxes around that and identify ways where cooperating groups of people who are building games or metaverse applications can find those areas of agreement and work within larger and larger frameworks. Just as like conceptually speaking, TCPIP just allows everybody to cooperate and not worry so much about the network layer anymore. You can just build within it. Very few people these days building an online game, you know, worry too much about it. Um, they just use what's already off the shelf. And then the fact that you've got, you know, a couple of really great 3D engines out there and you've got potentially the ability to define a common and consistent way to deliver the presentation of world space, that helps out a lot. But when I talk about like things like behavior in the world, it's not just like physics, for example, it could be like, what are the game rules that are associated with that object? How do you define those game rules? How do you make it easy to interpret process and execute and force the rules about a particular game object, for example, in a way that's super scalable and just works. So these are sort of interesting problems to solve for it, but you don't have to solve everything at once. You can break it down and create interfaces between them. And not everyone has to agree, by the way, like you could, you know, this comes back sometimes to the blockchain stuff. Like when I've talked about interoperability um, the use of blockchain to provide like a like an economic backplane for exchange of items between different experiences. The most common feedback is is kind of like, well, um, people have tried those kind of things and they've never really worked. Those people haven't really played something like Roblox, apparently, where people make all kinds of games and exchange items and they go between lots of different experiences. So, you know, there's there's ways to achieve like constellations of economic interoperability between games. So if I'm within a cooperating group of game makers, we could all agree that we'll allow a certain kind of item to go between our worlds, just like you have that right, literally right now in Roblox. And that doesn't mean enforced interoperability. It doesn't mean that that item that exists in one world has to go to other worlds. You can always man the gates. You can run your own theme park and say, here's what I'm gonna allow in, here's what I'm gonna allow out. So this is, this is to me real interoperability, which is allowing people to agree on the ways that they'll work with each other and have composability and allow smaller teams to do really interesting work where if they had to build an entire you know, platform for virtual worlds, they would never get to the actual cool idea about the experiences that they want to build. I think leaving, you know, the, the people who create the world setting the rules is important. I don't think, you know, when it, the kind of mandate and force interoperability of everything into anything. Interoperability doesn't mean that I go to World of Warcraft and my costume makes it into League of Legends. Like no one's, no one's trying to force game developers to do that. I think people want to make the option to individual game developers if they want to do that and decide how you render it, what that means, what it means socially, what it means economically, and allow you know, groups of developers to work together the way like a few Roblox developers do that today. Sorry, Mark, go ahead. No, no, I mean, look, it's, it's actually a very interesting segue into you know, interoperability, the mean to support a business model. And we, you know, we all aspire to this creative economy and you've been, you've been writing extensively uh, about that as well. Um, so we, we had Philip Rosdale on the, on the show a few weeks back talking about, you know, the second life business model, which was very simple. You, you pay a fee for being there, like some sort of property tax. And then you had a little bit of a, of a VAT or tax for exchange of goods uh, within the world. And that was pretty much it. 
you know, something that's a very, yeah. very simple bottom-up economy. It seems to work very well for Second Life. We're not seeing anything similar uh, in the Robloxes or all the Fortnites of the world. So do, do you have a, a view on what would be a, a natural, you know, economic model, natural business model or economic model for, for the metaverse? The first comment I want to just make about business models in general is this is why we need to allow for experimentation on all kinds of business models. So what, what I'm actually getting at is there's, there's a lot of platforms today that have big taxes associated with them. We know what platforms are talking about. They take a huge portion of revenue and they pretty much require that you have certain kinds of business models to be viable, either an in-app purchase model or an advertising model. And there's nothing wrong with those models inherently, but it's very constrained and we're not seeing innovation on all the other things you might do. So this is why I really like, this is why I still love PC games, right? As much as I use my mobile device all day long and I've got all the console, like there's, there's pretty much every device you can imagine from a gaming standpoint in my house. But I love PC because it's the platform where you can still pretty much choose to do whatever you want as a game developer. And you can create your own business models. And the web is like that too. Web has struggled to deliver the game experiences that people want. But web you could kind of almost think of as an extension of the whole PC gaming ethos because it's kind of open and unconstrained. So I want to see more of that. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's really important not to tax innovation and then expect innovation to happen. So that's sort of my high level thesis on it. Um, you know, in terms of business model specifically for metaverse, like one of the things I look at rather than tell you like, here's the formula for, to, for charging people to use your metaverse. Um, I know people are experimenting with things like land, not too dissimilar from what had been tried in Second Life and try and apply that to all these other newer metaverses that people are trying to create. I think it's interesting to just kind of look at what are the jobs that are actually going to be formed in the metaverse. And I think it's pretty interesting to think about real-time activity, real-time interaction. Um, you look at like music performance. Now it's been done with tens of millions of people and things like Roblox and Fortnite, for example. But I'm really interested in seeing how that scales out across a whole market where maybe every concert doesn't need to be for tens of millions. Maybe it's for a small group of people. And how do you deliver that experience? And how do you bring live performance um, to life across more and more of these applications? Because we already know that there's evidence for that, right? Not just the music I was referring to, but if you just look at esports, if you look at streamers, like there's so many things that could be the fusion between AI, live performers, people doing things, new avatar systems, spatial computing, new forms of creativity where I actually deliver an experience to you practically in real time, not unlike like LARPing and you know, dinner theater experiences, all of that stuff, we could tap into a whole new class of jobs who are like performance artists in the online world. So I look at that, I think of it as like really opening up creativity though. Some of it will be performance, some of it will be more bespoke, like the crafting of avatar costumes, the crafting of worlds. Like the more and more and more we can really open up the creative space so that if you can go direct from like imagination to the screen or whatever it is that we can cut down that loop uh, as much as possible, then you'll start to see the emergence of more of those jobs. And as people do the jobs, they'll, that is kind of how you're going to prove many of the use cases and you'll, you'll start to create things. So, you know, before we had Twitch, we had Justin TV, right? It was basically performance art. And then it became Twitch because we were proving that the job could work, right? So we need, the ability to allow people to do those jobs and not get in the way of the business models that they can employ. And, and we'll discover what the next generation of business models in these worlds will be. You know, we all aspire to a more transactional business model, I think, but we recently heard that Roblox is delving into advertising. So do you think it's a sign that the economic model needs advertising to be sustainable? Any kind of experiential product is really monetizing attention at the end of the day. 
right? So advertising is a good way to monetize attention for a certain class of content. So for content where there are not a lot of tremendous incentives, say to make an in-app purchase and buy something or where the the incentive to do so is very, very low. Something like advertising can end up, end up becoming a more efficient way to monetize that attention. But whether it was putting quarters in the arcade machine years ago or buying the sequels to a franchise or buying DLC as it keeps coming out, like everything is really back to attention. So advertising is totally legitimate. For, there's, a cla there's a whole um, body of games and content where advertising is, you know, just going to be the best way to do it. What I would hope, just kind of related to the earlier statement I made, though, is I hope we don't just converge on one business model that everybody has to do, right? So on mobile games, for example, you kind of have to build... Um, you know, IP transaction based games today, because it's just not, it's not really economically viable unless you're in pretty specific use cases for advertising or part of big, big content networks where you're constantly sending the user from one, you know, hyper casual game to the next. Largely, it's still an IAP driven um, business model, but that's kind of the way the system intentionally or not was designed. So, you know, it comes back to give people the flexibility to experiment and try things, um, charge for things directly, come up with new subscription models on their own. Like there's so many different ways to approach business models, all of which will end up relate in some way or another to attention capture without telling them what they have to do. For me, advertising is, uh, is responsible for a lot of the issues we're seeing with the current web, you know, the current mobile platform. So that's why I'm always kind of wondering if there is a way we can do advertising and it doesn't take the prominent space and drive the behaviors of everything like we've seen in the past 15 years. So that's an open question in my mind. I think that things are going to get more community oriented, more social over time. Like uh, it's amazing to me, for example, that Discord doesn't, try to just sell me games directly that my friends are playing um, because that would just, I mean, I'm just sort of riffing off the idea. Like the fact that I can see what my friends are playing and immediately maybe get some insight into what's fun about it and make a purchasing decision, you know, stuff like that, I think is going to become more and more common. Um, if it's not quite as a direct, I mean, I kind of described a direct response model, but even in cases where it isn't direct response, the fact that people have social organizations that they play in, like guilds and clans and whatnot, making the social groups more transportable from experience to experience is something that some games would benefit from on the incoming side, at least. And, and I think it's interesting to think about a meta layer that wraps around a lot of games that allows that kind of transportation. And we already have people, again, back to performance, like esports and streamers and whatnot, they have their own communities. So thinking about how you take those communities and you intersect it with the whole way games are propagated, not necessarily through advertising and sponsorship, which clearly they already do that, but I, I see companies starting to think about more creative ways of interfacing, shopping experiences and introductions and things like that. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. I'm optimistic too, so. So John, we covered a lot of good stuff today. I mean, first, thanks for sharing your passion for developers and game developers. So it was great to talk about infrastructure to enable developers and creators, just defining the metaverse, um, the breadth of interoperability topics than everything you and Mark were just talking about around economics and business models. Uh, as you know, we like to wrap up the episode with a shout out. If there's any person or organization you want to give a shout out to? Well, certainly I got to give a shout out to my team back at Beamable. They're amazing and, and they can really help you build a game that's a live game. But I'm going to go back to where we started the whole discussion today. I got to give a shout out to my parents because it was uh, my father who plopped me in front of that VT100 terminal when I was eight years old and set me on this path. And uh, it, it's been 
an incredible career to be able to make games and work with game creators and build online technology. So thanks, Dad. Thank you, John. Well, uh, that was that was fascinating. I mean, you know, you are a true uh, a true game you know gamer and game dev at heart. And that's why we love this community so much. So it was fantastic to have you, John Radoff. You're the CEO of Beamable. You're also a, a, blo a blog author on Medium called Building the Metaverse. Strongly encourage people to uh, to follow you, read uh, everything you've been writing uh, about games and the metaverse. It's been fantastic to have you. Thanks. Thank you very much, John, for being with us today. Thank you so much. Patrick, thank you too. Thank you, everybody who are listening. Uh, we always like the, to hear your feedback like to hear your suggestions and your critiques. So please hit us on social. Let us know what you think about the podcast. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We'll be back with a new episode in a few, in a few weeks. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody.